The U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center's lecture series is presented to a live audience and provides insight into leadership and war fighting from scholars and soldiers, helping us educate future military leaders and the public. The opinions and statements of the speakers featured on this presentation are not necessarily the views of the United States Army or the Army Heritage and Education Center. Ladies and gentlemen, today is March 23rd, 2023, and on behalf of the team here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to our second lecture of the 2023 spring season of the Perspectives in Military History lecture series. We welcome you all here and all over the world on our live stream feed. For those of you listening live online, remember that you can submit a question for the Q&A portion at the end of the lecture by typing it into the chat room and we will include them in the discussion following the lecture. My name is Dan Kellum. I'm one of the digital archivists here in the collection division for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. Uh, tonight I have the honor of representing the whole of USAHEC and the U.S. Army War College by introducing tonight's program and the speaker. For tonight's lecture series, we'd like to present a first for the USA Heck, a fiction novel which follows four characters during the winter season surrounding the Euromaidan protests in Kyiv in 2013. Our speaker tonight, Kalani Pickhart, has painted a portrait of human perseverance and empathy in I Will Die in a Foreign Land, winning the 2022 Young Lions Fiction Award a Best Book of 21, 2021 by the New York Public Library and featured on NPR, CBS, Sunday, Sunday Morning, the Washington Post Book Club Newsletter, and other publications. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine still in full swing, it's, important, it's an important time to explore the origins and catalysts of that current conflict through creative means. To help us do this, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to present Kalani Pickhart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's incredible to be here. This is my first time um, here at Carlisle, um, and it's an honor to be um, among our active duty soldiers and uh, veterans um, who must be thanked for um, their service to our country. So thank you. Um, I have some connections to the military. Um, my little brother has just completed basic training um, for the US Navy and is gradu graduating in Illinois today. So, um, <laughs> so my, uh, my mom um, and stepdad are, made the trek out there to uh, see his graduation. So, and happy birthday, mom. So when you read this. Uh, <laughs> um, my grandpa uh, was a sergeant first class in the US Army. Um, and he was part of the 82nd Airborne. Um, his brother served in the US Navy and my great grandpa, their dad, uh, served in World War II as part of the then US Army Air Force. Um, also, my dad was an Austrian citizen. Um, English was his second language and he immigrated to San Francisco with his mother when he was 12. When he turned 18, uh, he joined the US Air Force and when I was two years old, we lived in Germany on a NATO base just um, as the Berlin Wall was coming down. Uh, in short, uh, it feels faded um, that I'm among you today. Before I begin, I wanted to thank uh, Doug Cubison, Carl Warner, Hannah Hankey, and Sergeant Julian Hernandez for all their help in getting me here. It's an honor to have been invited, and I thank all of you for being here today and on the internet. Um, before I begin, um, I wanted to let you know that I've, I've split this presentation into two parts. Uh, part one will cover the state of fiction today, and part two will center around I Will Die in a Foreign Land and how it came to be. That age-old question, why don't I just write what's real? A lot of 20th century and 21st century American readers think that's all they want. They want nonfiction. They, they'll say, 
I don't read fiction because it isn't real. This is incredibly naive. Fiction is something only human beings do, and only in certain circumstances. Ursula K. Le Guin, The Paris Review. Part one, the flight simulator. Shortly, began, shortly before I began preparing this presentation, I was talking with a friend about it um, and said something to the effect of, I'm a little nervous about this. Um, I feel like I'm going to talk about the benefits of reading fiction and everyone in the audience is going to think, well, duh. Um, and then he said, you know, speaking from personal experience, a lot of people probably think if they're going to sit down and read something, like an actual book, <laughs> they need to get something out of it and learn something. So most people might turn to nonfiction or, or nonfiction adjacent over fiction. This could be in the way of psychology books, uh, maybe spiritual guidance, self-help, or it could be social or political commentary, history, memoir, biography, etc. And he was right. According to Forbes, adult nonfiction revenue totaled 6.18 billion across the publishing industry in 2017, while adult fiction revenues reached only 4.3 billion. And here's a chart for those of you who love charts. <laughs> Adult fiction was the only one of the major categories to have a sales increase from last year over 2021. This is from Publishers Weekly. Why do we so often reach for nonfiction? Well, I think it's like my friend said, we are looking to educate ourselves. Nonfiction relays the truth through facts, figures, anecdotes, a valuable art that is critical to understanding the world and documenting the saga of humankind. We need these books to remember, to learn, and to confront this multifaceted, complex reality of being alive in the world. My novel would not have existed had it not been a few powerful nonfiction books, one being Voices of Chernobyl by Svetlana Alexievich, which is a collage of real life accounts of survivors of the nuclear disaster. Nonfictional texts are often an excavation of our past, our society, our scientific and cultural landscapes. So if nonfiction is often considered synonymous with the truth and education, why would we even bother to read fiction? Sorry. Okay. From 2019 through 2022, I mentioned there was an uptick in adult fiction sales. This is partially accredited to a phenomenon known as book talk, um, a subgroup of TikTok users that talk about their experiences reading and recommending books. This audience has been particularly meaningful um, for prolific romance novelist Colleen Hoover, who has six books in the New York Times bestseller list as of March 2023. In an article from the Washington Post published in January 2022, a number of book talk users and fans of Colleen Hoover were interviewed which are primarily young women in their early 20s. And, though, and although I've never read any of Hoover's books myself, um, what struck me from this article were a couple of quotes taken from her readers. I feel like we all just want to feel something so badly. I've gotten comments like, can you give me recommendations on where I'll just cry? <laughs> People have lost people and lost their jobs, and I think sometimes it's easier to read about other people's stories than it is to live out your own. These young readers, without knowing it, have tapped into some of the recent scholarship surrounding fiction and its effect on human behavior. In a 2019 BBC article titled, Does Reading Fiction Make Us Better People? Journalist and author Claudia Hammond relates some of the most fascinating psychological studies related to fiction. Reading fiction, it turns out, results in the following behaviors. An increase in philanthropic giving and volunteering, an Im improved social cognition, elevated feelings and acts of empathy. The National Endowment of the Arts published a study called, titled the arts and civic engagement involved in arts, involved in life. 
which touched on some key and surprising findings from their survey of public participation in the arts, which was conducted by the US Census Bureau and surveyed nearly 18,000 adults. Though these findings also include data in the performing arts, I'm going to focus only on the um, literary reader data. Okay. In this study, literary readers uh, refers to those who read short stories, novels, plays, or poetry. Or poetry. Uh, so non-readers are those who reported not reading any of those genres. So this would also include then nonfiction readers. And here are the results of their findings. Um, perhaps the most unsurpri unsurprising is that uh, literary readers are more likely to go attend other arts events, um, such as going to museums or movie theaters, as well as attending plays and concerts. We have a track record of being nerdy, so none of these made me like fall out of my chair. But take a look at this one. Literary readers are emerging in sports one and a half are engaging in sports one and a half times more than non-readers, both as spectators and as athletes themselves. And this one, literary readers participate two times more than non-readers in outdoor activities like camping and hiking, as well as general exercise. Literary readers are creating art three times more than non-readers, which isn't completely a surprise. Um, considering that some longtime readers one day become authors themselves. And lastly, uh, literary readers are three times as likely to volunteer in their communities. Why? Polling is one way to gather data, but this study doesn't answer that question. Individuals may be willing to participate in these activities, and least of all, it doesn't answer the question of why does reading incite people to give their time and money to philanthropic causes? Fortunately, we now live in a modern area, an era where brain imaging allows us to scientifically evaluate whether or not long-held beliefs and anecdotes surrounding fiction and empathy are true through the use of fMRI machines. In these studies, participants would be asked to read varying passages or sentences to see which parts of the brain, if any, were triggered. Researchers at Emory University uncovered a number of startling findings, including the specificity of what parts of the brain were activated while reading sensory details. For example, not only were language centers of the brain stimulated while participants read passages, but the parts of the brain devoted to smells were activated when reading words like cinnamon and lavender. When vivid me metaphors were used, like the singer had a velvety voice, the parts of the brain associated with touch and texture were activated. Conversely, a flatter phrase like the singer had a pleasing voice had no effect. A study from the Laboratory of Language Dynamics in France found similarly that the parts of the brain associated with the motor cortex of the arm were activated when reading sentences with phrases using the words like grasping, and the motor contact cortex of the leg were activated while reading the word kicking. Other research at Emory University found that reading a novel can cause changes to the brain days after reading. Dr. Gregory Burns led this study, which involved examining the brain patterns of 12 university students who read the thriller Pompeii by Robert Harris. Unlike the aforementioned studies, which involved participants actively reading while the brain scans were going on, the participants were scanned after reading the book. And the study was described from the Daily Mail as follows. After completing all nine sections of the novel, the participants were scanned over five more mornings in a resting state. The results showed a heightened con connectivity in an area of the brain which is associated with receptivity for language, and in the primary sensory motor of the brain. So they're still feeling the character. The neural changes that we found associated with physical sensation and movement systems suggest that reading a novel can transport you into the body of the protagonist. Even though the participants were not actually reading the novel while they were in the scanner, they retained this heightened connectivity, Burns said. 
We call that a shadow activity, almost like a muscle memory. When I first cited this quote, um, I misquoted Dr. Burns as saying a shadow memory. And I've grown to kind of like that. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is because it uh, seems to articulate the feeling one gets when reliving an experience that feels firsthand, um, but wasn't. And when we, and, and when we read a book, um, isn't that what happens? Um, who hasn't read a novel and upon finishing the last page in bed at night, wakes up the next morning and feel as if they were emerging from a fog? Was it a dream I had? No, it was the body I left behind. Dr. Keith Oatley, Professor Emeritus of the University of Toronto in his article, Fiction, Stimulation of Social Worlds, posits that reading acts as a form of virtual reality, citing that the brain makes little distinction between reading and real life encounters. He calls fiction the mind's flight simulator, stating that just as pilots can practice flying before ever leaving the ground, people who read fiction are sharpening their ability to relate to others and, the, and deeper their connection to the characters, the more the reader, the more the reader considers the dire, desires of the character, they think less of their own. This is known in psychology as theory of mind, which refers to the capacity to understand other people by ascribing mental states to them that is, surmising what is happening in their mind. This includes the knowledge that others' mental states may be different from one's own states and include beliefs, desires, intentions, emotions, and thoughts. Processing a functional theory of mind is considered crucial for success in everyday human interactions. People use such a theory when analyzing, judging, and inferring others' behavior. Dr. Raymond Marr, a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto wrote the following abstract, abstract on the study he conducted in the effects of fiction versus nonfiction. Um, and so I found it really charming when I read this uh, first sentence. While frequent readers are often stereotyped as socially awkward, this may only be true of nonfiction readers and not readers of fiction. <laughs> it looks like Marr and the NEA were very much trying to make sure that they were not nerds. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, what's more nerdy than that? All right. So uh, Mars' paper goes on to argue, we are all familiar with the stereotype of the bookworm. An image leaps automatically to mind, that of a nebbish and unfashionable individual wearing spectacles whose demeanor is largely ca characterized by the social awkwardness one might expect from someone who has chosen the company of print over peers. There are, however, good reasons to expect that the stereotype of social impairment may only pertain to nonfiction readers, and furthermore, that the very opposite may be true of fiction readers. Nonfiction is typically expository in nature, whereas fiction most often takes the form of narrative. Although these two forms of text are highly similar, both are discourse level text with local and global coherence, they are not identical in structure or content. Stories contain depictions of the actual word replete with intentional agents pursuing goals to form a plot, whereas expository texts, in contrast, share no such parallels with the actual world. So the processing of narratives then share some sim similarities with the processing of a real social environment. Thus, frequent readers of narrative fiction, individuals who could be considered bookworms, may bolster or maintain social processing skills while reading stories, although they are removed from actual social contact. Conversely, frequent readers of nonfiction expository texts, individuals colloquially referred to as nerds, could be headed toward an embodiment of the socially awkward stereotype by removing themselves from the actual social realm while also not stimulating the experience in a fictional one. So reading fiction on its outset appears to be this form of escapism, an avoidance of reality. But according to scientific study, it's actually a tool for processing our own human experience. Literary readers have shown to be more altruistic, 
more interested in sports and outdoors and the arts. And it's because when you read a book of fiction, you are not simply connecting with another person. Um, you smell what they smell. You kick when they kick. You imprint your own experiences and knowledge into the world, and they imprint on you. Reading fiction is a mirror. When we connect with a character, we connect with a part of ourselves. When we connect with a part of ourselves and show ourselves empathy and compassion and understanding, we're able to share these graces with others. It's no wonder then that literary readers are three times more likely to create art themselves. It's because we've lived many lifetimes. We've been flying that simulator on the ground for years and years. For some of us, we're curious what it's like to lift off, to become airborne, to become the pilot. And so we take off, and it's thrilling, until we learn very quickly that the weather feels different when you're the one writing the story, as if finding oneself without a parachute, suspended in air. A novel worth reading is an education of the heart, and enlarges your sense of human possibility, of what human nature is, of what happens to the world. It's a creator of inwardness. Susan Sontag, The Paris Reveal. Part two, shadow memory. I didn't set out to write a book about Ukraine. I had uh, no bloodline or personal connection to the country or its people. And in the early stages of the book, I often questioned whether um, I should be the one to write it. Wouldn't it be better <laughs> for a Ukrainian writer to tell the story? Um, perhaps someone who lived it firsthand or someone who heard the story from friends or loved ones. Still, when the idea came and I wrote down the voices I heard for the first time, I had to know more about them. I had to find out if I could write the story. But I knew I needed to do more research, and if possible, I needed to speak with real Ukrainians about the book. I was connected to a Ukrainian woman who was in the US as part of a fellowship at our university. Her name was Narmina, and she was a journalist. Her husband was a doctor, and they had both been at Euromaidan during the protests. More importantly, or just as importantly, <laughs> she encouraged me to write the book, and this became my MFA thesis. It was 2016 when I started writing, two years after the annexation of Crimea and the start of the war in Donbass, and most you and most Americans had failed to pay attention, including myself. The media coverage was nearly non-existent, or at least it seemed that way. I was moved by a documentary, Winter on Fire, that I happened to watch between my graduate classes one day. I was floored by the tenacity of the Ukrainian people that even when their government failed them, they had the collective strength to gather around Independence Square in the dead of winter, despite beatings, disappearances, and deaths brought upon them by the police force that was designed to protect them. When we write about history, even historical fiction, we write about it through the lens of our current moment. Even recounting a story of something that happened to us on our way to work is colored by our own personal experience. I knew Ukraine had a complicated and textured past, and even though I had accepted the fact that I was going to tell this story through an American lens, I believed I was not altogether at a disadvantage. We're no strangers to protests in the United States. The civil rights movement, Vietnam, the war on drugs, the women's rights movement, Stonewall, and more. Recently, we had the uh, George Floyd protests in 2020, and so on. It is innately American to protest against oppression, injustice, and unethical decisions made by individuals in power. American protesters have been met with brutal force and violence by their own police force, and still, in the face of death and loss, have stood their ground. We confront authority with skepticism, and it has always been our right. Ukraine is a country so determined to be European, to be a part of the free world of democratic nations. 
Americans, Ukrainians, we speak the language of revolution. As fiction writers, we aren't taught how to lie. <laughs> we tell the truth as the truth appears in the world in which we are writing. How then to tell the truth of an alien planet or the Dust Bowl when you've never seen or experienced either? The truth in fiction differs from that of nonfiction because it relies on the healthy skepticism of the reader. It, there is an unsaid pact between us that the author will lead and the reader will follow. As an author, I expect my audience to expect a lot from me. The narrative I create has to be cohesive and believable, and while it can be surprising, the twist shouldn't feel cheap or obscure or lazy, or else the story will no longer feel real. And thus, the reader will be taken out of story. They'll take off their blindfold and say, hey, this doesn't feel right. And then the author has lost them, and that trust becomes irreparably broken. In order for I Will Die in a Foreign Land to be authentic and accepted by readers at the most basic level, I had to begin with the literal facts of the period and the culture. I spent years immersing myself in all things Ukraine. I started following UK Ukrainian news and English-speaking journalists that were, were, were reporting on the region, especially the war in Donbass. I listened to Ukrainian music, both contemporary artists and folk, folk songs, I needed to know what Ukrainians were listening to at Maidan. I needed to know what they were singing at the funeral for the Heavenly Hundred. I needed to know what songs the pianists were playing in the street. I watched documentaries and scoured thousands of photos to find out what the camp looked like, the makeshift hospitals, what did the babusi make for meals, what supplies did they bring. The summer before I finished graduate school, I was awarded a fellowship from the US Department of State Bureau of Intelligence to take an eight-week Ukrainian language intensive, followed by a research trip to Kiev and Prague. Inevitably, the research I did online or through the library could only take me so far, um, and I had to uh, learn how to read and speak Ukrainian, even if I knew I would never speak it fluently. I had to learn because how else would I know what these voices were trying to tell me? When I started writing this novel, I heard Katya's voice first. She was a doctor in Kiev as a volunteer. Her marriage was dissolving after the sudden death of her son from a heart defect. She had grown up in New England and had only been to Ukraine as a child. She didn't know her biological parents, and she felt guilty for that ache, having been loved by her adoptive family. And so too was Alexander, who appeared shortly after Katya. He was a dying Soviet soldier whose narrative manifested in the form of a recorded lament. As a child, Alexander's god was Lenin. He worshiped his father, who had been a soldier in World War II. Alexander followed his footsteps, followed in his footsteps, and also found success in the military, while later becoming an active agent in the KGB. But unlike his father, Alexander questioned his orders. He was disturbed to find that the Czech people didn't welcome the Soviets as they, were as they entered Prague in tanks in August of 1968. He wasn't a hero like his father. And so every column he had made of this temple began to fall apart until many years later, in 2013, Alexander finds himself in Kiev. They were, like me, an outsider to the Euromaidan, to Ukraine. They were my way into the story, and I felt they would be helpful to readers who weren't familiar with that world to feel somewhat grounded. In the first scene, Katya is at St. Michael smoking outside, thinking of home in the United States. We immediately have someone to relate to. We immediately have someone uh, like the person at the party who you know, the one person, and you kind of glom onto them, and after a while, you begin to, to branch out and start talking to other people. So Misha, Slava, and the Kobzari chorus came after I gained more confidence, not just my knowledge of Ukrainian culture and attitudes, but my confidence and ability to tell their truth. There was a moment 
in Kiev that was a turning point in the way I related to Ukraine that I wasn't expecting. It was my first visit to St. Michael's Monastery, one of many trips. It was my third day in the city. I stayed in an apartment on Shovkovchina Street, just here, the street um, that Slava stayed on, a character in the book. So for the first days, I was in the city. I would walk the same path that Slava and Misha would have walked to Maidan. And on the third day, I wore a shawl to cover my hair, and I walked to St. Michael's. And um, as I neared the church, um, I wasn't expecting a, a feeling that I had. Um, I was overwhelmed by this strange feeling of having been there before. I found a bench inside the church and stayed, listening to the reverberating hymns and the prayers, the smell of candles burning. It had been an hour at least, just allowing the feeling when the realization came all at once. I had been there before, through Katya. Katya had been a voice in my mind for so long, but this place was real. And all at once, Katya became real. I didn't have the language for it then, but it was a shadow memory. I didn't choose to write this novel so much as it manifested, first as an image, then a sound, then a voice, a voice, a voice. And I just started recording everything I heard and saw in my mind. I've often felt I was merely its vessel, um, a conduit. There are times when I read passages from this book where I don't even recognize my own hand in them. I find myself thinking, it can't be possible that I wrote this bit of wisdom because I'm not nearly as wise as these people. But I am the people in this book. I have grieved unexpected and sudden losses. I have fallen in love and I have ruined love and I have been ruined by love. I have ventured to a different country or walked into a room full of strangers where everything was unfamiliar and I tried desperately to fit in. I have mourned the loss of my childhood home. I know what it means to be an orphan. I know what it means to be neglected, manipulated, abused. I have known fear and I have known elation. I know what it's like to discover beauty in a state of ruin. And yet, I am still an outsider. I haven't experienced the loss of a child, the Prague Spring, the aftermath of Chernobyl, or the Euromaidan. I would never be able to capture what can only be experienced firsthand. And yet, that is why we create, to incite feeling for ourselves and for others, to try to understand, to share. I was moved by the Euromaidan and the Ukrainian people enough to try to capture it and I tested the limits of my own artistic being for it. I too will only know the simulation. As a writer, you're never actually able to lift off because as much as these characters are me, they're not me. They stand apart from me, exist without me. The act of writing fiction though feels so much like the act of reading it. I'm not certain on the science of that, but I don't exactly need to know. I already believe it. I have my own shadow memories from this book, and according to the science, that's the next best thing to reality. I will likely never write another book on Ukraine, though my life has been changed because of it. I still receive the same news alerts and daily emails, I still follow the same journalists who have since grown in their careers. I look forward eagerly for the day we see a Ukrainian victory across headlines. I've invested my heart in this work 
in the people in this book, in the Ukrainian people. Though the ink may have dried for I will die in a foreign land, it has not yet dried for Ukraine. Slava Ukraini, glory to the heroes, thank you. Start with an online question. Thank you, Colin. Um, my question is uh, about uh, film the captive. I, I think your book is terrific. It's a wonderful tribute to the human imagination. I, you know, I kind of bought all of it so much so <laughs> that um, I'm wondering about. Like in your imagination, what might have happened to the child born of Jara and Alexandra? She was the woman who was, she gave birth yeah. while she was in the gulag. Mm -hmm. and, and like the Cossack guard took the child and said he was going to give it to his daughter and son-in-law. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I guess I want to know, like just in your own imagination, what yeah. do you think happened to the child? or? If you want to think of it historically, what would have happened to children? There must have been a lot of children mm -hmm. born in the gulag. I have mm -hmm. no idea what happened to them. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah, so um, this is a, maybe a spoiler alert. Um, so um, for me, uh, in order for me to write the book, I still don't know if this is actually true and every reader has their own interpretation of it and I intentionally left it open. But I wrote that story intentionally to connect Katya as an orphan to Alexander and Yara. And um, so that is, uh, I wrote it as if she was his child, um, but whether or not that is actually true, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I leave, I leave it open for the reader, so. I wasn't anticipating that. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was a joy writing that, actually. Thank you for that question, ma'am. Anyone else in the room at the moment uh, got a question? All right, uh, the gentleman up here in the front. Uh, while Tim gets over here, I'm going to get this question in from Mike joining us online. He wants to know that you mentioned your interaction with the Ukrainian journalist that encouraged you to write the novel. Can you tell us more about that interaction, exactly what it was that she told you that confirmed that you were on the right track with how you were writing? Yeah, I think at that point um, when I met Narmina, um, you know, it was, like I said, 2016, so the war in Donbass had already been going on for two years. And um, I think Ukrainians, or at least my interpretation of it, because it's always my, you know, I'm, I'm not. So um, my interpretation was that she was excited that an American person with no connection to Ukraine was actually interested in what happened in Ukraine. Um, and uh, even though, you know, it could have been a Ukrainian author and um, to write a book, and there are Ukrainian authors who have written many, many books about, um, you know, this and, and other uh, events in Ukrainian history. Um, I felt after that conversation um, that it kind of needed me um, because, you know, you, people weren't necessarily looking in America for that story. They weren't um, seeking it out. And really at the time you had to seek it out, um, which I did. And so the fear, like the, the sheer like act of, you know, <laughs> showing an interest in that, um, in that part of the world and what she had experienced 
um, was very meaningful for her. And so she was like, yes. And honestly, the more um, Ukrainians that I talked to, even when I was doing my Ukrainian language course, um, they were also, you know, very excited about it. Um, there was one, uh, there was a young girl, young girl, she was 18. She was a, a freshman in a, in a college and um, her family was um, from Ukraine. And um, we had an event um, where her family was there and her mother came up to me and was just like, I heard you're writing this book. And that was like the biggest um, compliment and, and encouragement. Um, I haven't had yet any uh, Ukrainian um, people who have told me that it was a mistake to do this. Um, and I think part of that comes from the fact that I've never tried to pretend to be something that I'm not. Um, the book itself is sort of a, an homage to them and my appreciation and my understanding of their, um, their experiences and culture. And um, so I think for them, it's, you know, I, I tried to be as honest and as real as possible. And it was so important to get all the details right. Um, but yeah, I've, I've only been met with um, appreciation for it. My turn. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was interested in your juxtaposition of fiction and nonfiction. And I want to raise the question of a book like Hamilton, which takes an individual and really brings the detail of their life out. And when you read it, you, it's, it's, there's so much more there than you were aware of that it, it appears to me it may have kind of the same quality as to your thoughts and, and so on as fiction does. Mm -hmm. What might be your comments about that? You know, while I was thinking about this presentation, I was um, also thinking about like memoir um, and um, autobiography and that sort of thing, because these are people that are really relaying like experiences that they've had. Um, and I'm not familiar with the book you mentioned, um, but I am, I am interested in um, the difference between nonfiction and fiction because I'm, I think, one of the first fiction writers to present here. And um, the thought behind my invitation was to, um, to sort of, I guess, uh, fill maybe a gap that was missing um, through this, like, you know, historical analysis or, um, you know, fact finding and the story of something um, that can just sort of be, you know, told. These are the facts. This is what happened, and this is what we learned. Um, whereas, like, fiction itself is. Uh, once I started diving into the research, I was not aware of any of this, that like your brain, you know, has these synapses that like, you know, like start going off when you read certain things. Um, and that being said, I don't really believe in like the binary between nonfiction and fiction. I think that there's very often, um, you know, this exploration now of cross genre. So you might find, um, you know, books that don't actually fit into one genre or another. You know, my own book, um, they're, you know, I'm like, what is this gonna be published as, <laughs> you know? Um, historical fiction, literary fiction. Um, you know, I think that putting things in boxes can be, you know, ultimately problematic. Um, and so uh, for the purposes of the presentation to sort of illustrate the benefit of fiction, I anticipated coming into a group that was used to hearing nonfiction. And so I'm saying, hey, hey, buy what I'm selling. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, of course, yeah. All right, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. We have one from online, we have one in the room. All right, in that case, uh, Matt uh, asked, you spoke about the idea of shadow memory how has writing the story affected you or given you the shadow memory affected you? Elaborate more on that. Say that last part again, the shadow memory. 
that uh, how has writing the story affected or given you the shadow memory effect? If you could touch a little bit more on that. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, I think for me it's, it's, it's different. Um, uh, it's, I feel like I was living in this simulation for years, whereas like maybe a reader is living in the simulation for, you know, a week, two weeks, you know, reading the book. Um, so for me, like I think coming out of it um, and sort of, you know, realizing that uh, my book was, you know, going to be published and it was going to be out in the world, um, the strangest feeling I had after the whole publishing of the book was, um, or hearing that we were going to publish the book, which I thought was also a miracle because <laughs> I was, uh, you know, the book was picked up by a small press in Ohio, um, an independent press that is very amazing, um, but they saw potential in it. And so I was thinking, you know, the whole time that I'm writing this book, don't worry, Kalani, go wild. No one will read it. Um, and um, I'm glad that that's not the case. Uh, but I, I was fortunate that, um, you know, my press wanted to, wanted to print this book, and we were printing the book before the current, you know, this current invasion from Russia. And so uh, when that happened, um, that changed a lot of things for me. Um, I remember, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm following the news. I'm, I'm a proxy Ukrainian or something, um, and, I've been so invested in these characters and their lives, and I couldn't help but become invested in Ukrainian people because I felt like I knew them. I feel like I personally knew them, and I did know some of them, but when I was in you know, Katya's mind or Misha's mind, I was very much um, feeling some of the emotions that they were feeling, and uh, so when that simulation was over, it had this sort of like, long depression in a way um, to try and figure out like what's next. And I feel like I'm still in that, that space of like what's next after you've dedicated your life to being in this world, what comes after? And um, so when the book was actually released uh, the night before, you know, most people are supposed to be excited, you know, like, yeah, my book comes out tomorrow. I was beside myself. I wanted to sit in a room and just not engage because I was in mourning. Um, because at one point, it's, it was finally over. It was going to be in print. It was done. The, it was done. Any, any relation that I had to these characters were now going to be uh, through interactions like this, where people have read the book and talk about the characters. And then I get to get excited and say like, oh, God, yeah, you know. Um, but because the simulation's over, um, I feel so much more distance from it. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Kalani. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I want to recall to the beginning, I guess uh, as a nonfiction reader, I have a scientific study to read. I might be a nerd. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think, I think some people agree with yeah. that. Yeah, no offense. Um, but, but what you were talking about, um, being able to fill in those real stories with this artistic license, which these feelings, these sentiments that you can't necessarily ascribe to people in a nonfiction book, I think that's very important. So if you are a nonfiction reader, um, I would highly encourage you to pick up this book. It doesn't uh, have to be my book. Out. It can be any fiction book, because I guarantee if you find a good one, as you know, it'll take you different places. So on behalf of the director and the United States Army Heritage and Education Command, I'd like to present to you this challenge coin. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to our lecture. The U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, USA is an integral part of the U.S. Army War College and maintains the knowledge repositories that support scholarship and research about the U.S. Army and its operating environment. To learn more about the Army's history or to plan a visit to our center, please visit us online at www.usahec.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to learn more about past and upcoming events.